Describe the original vision for Castle Hills and what convinced you that it was a good and workable vision. Well, I think a lot of times people are, are not aware of that when you're starting these things, you're really just dealing with a piece of real estate. And so, I mean, realistically, we started the planning on Castle Hills in 1982. So I was roughly 26, 27 years old. <laughs> and, and the first thing that we really worked on was the road patterns. And once the road patterns were in place, then we could start to figure out what we wanted the development to look like. So we really started pretty much full time on the planning on it in the early 90s. And, and since I grew up in the park cities, I kind of used it as a planning model. But when, when we talk about what we were trying to do vision wise, we're really trying to just create a special place to live, okay? And what were the elements that went into making it a special place to live? And so when we focused on those things, I grew up in an area that was primarily residential. I also know that in the real world, commercial is what drives the tax base of cities, okay? And if there's not a significant commercial tax base, it's very difficult for the single family housing basically to pay for itself. And so, we, decide, we decided to begin with the single family, but we saved most of the frontage that we had against the freeways for the future commercial development. And so that's kind of the way we, we focused in it. And I, I do think it's important to understand that a developer's role in, in the creation of something like this is mainly to make sure he doesn't create impediments that allow the community to not be what it wants to be. And so what we tried to do at Castle Hills was focus on those things that we thought would make a special residential community and put those into our planning elements. And it's, and it's I had a land planner, a guy named John Krasinski from Mill Valley, California, who worked with me in the early stages of it. And he asked me what I wanted him to do. And I said, well, I want you to represent the homeowners, okay? I have no problem with figuring out ways to gather density to put more stuff in, but I need somebody in this planning process who is thinking about it from the perspective of those people who are going to live here. And so that was really John's role in the early aspects of what we were doing. And we tried to focus on, in the single family in particular, what the negatives of what I've seen in a lot of suburban communities. And what I call a lot of suburban communities are backdoor neighborhoods, where they basically, you know you're, you're rear neighbor better than you know your front neighbor. <laughs> and so, uh, because that's where you enter the house, is through the, through the garage. And so in the early stages of Castle Hills, the first lots, basically we were alley served, but the builders were required to build entries into the garage from the front of the house. And the idea was to push people into the front of the yard, their houses instead of into the rear of their houses. And uh, so that was kind of the thought process. And then we started talking about what are the different elements that make people uh, want to come outside. Well, parks was a big part of it, okay? Uh, and we, we kind of said in the early days that we wanted to uh, have a park within walking distance of every home. And since I'm from Texas, I defined walking distance as three blocks or less because I don't know most many people that'll walk farther than that in July. <laughs> I mean, so uh, that's kind of the approach that we took. And, and we looked at a lot of different aspects of it. Uh, one of the first things that we decided to do was widen the front parkways to six and a half feet from the standard five and to widen the sidewalks from the typical four feet to five feet because it's very difficult to walk side by side down a four foot wide sidewalk. I mean, so we, we wanted a couple to be able to walk down the sidewalk side by side, not necessarily uh, kind of going single file. We also looked at what we see in neighborhoods, which is one of the things we noticed was that uh, houses kind of create almost like a wall as you go down the street. So we wanted to figure out a way to vary the front yard setbacks so that when you drove down a street, it didn't look like you were driving down a tunnel. It, it had some variation in the way the homes looked. And so we ended up, in working with the city of Louisville, uh, we ended up basically coming up with abilities for a house to sit closer to the street if it built what we called a qualifying front porch. So a front porch big enough to sit on, 
okay? I mean, but to put furniture on. And that allowed that house to sit a little closer to the street, and it helped us to basically change the streetscape piece. Uh, we also, and this was one of the early disagreements we had with Louisville. We hadn't had a whole lot, pretty much. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that I've had but one vote in uh, the history of our relationship with Louisville that has not been unanimous at the city council. And I don't know that I have ever gone to the city council uh, without a 100% endorsement of the staff. So that makes it easier to get a positive vote from the council. But this was one that we didn't have an agreement on, and that was the width of the streets. Uh, and the normal street in Louisville is 31 feet back of curb to back of curb. When I look at the, the literature on this stuff, the American Society of Civil Engineers recommends a 26 to 28 foot wide street for a residential street, narrower. And uh, so I, that's when I came up with the idea of what we have with the rollover curbs in, in Castle Hills. And those are a 26 and a quarter inch profile rather than a six inch profile. So the, what they do from a practical standpoint is they create a perception that the street is narrower than it is. And, uh, and the point of, for me doing that was I wanted to slow the traffic down, okay? The more conflicts there are in the street, the less likely it is for people to drive fast. So that's why we did those and the 25 mile an hour speed limits that we put into Castle Hills all was an attempt, since it was primarily a residential neighborhood at that point, as an attempt to slow down the traffic. And I think it's been relatively successful. I mean, I never really believed that people would drive 25, <laughs> but, but I was hoping by putting it in at 25 that I could hold them to 30 to 32. And, and that's what I think has happened to a large extent. And so all of these little elements went in in detail and the thought process went into the, the thought process behind Castle Hills. And what I was able to do with Louisville was meet with a small select group of their staff, which they brought in and out. And I got a commitment from, uh, most of these guys aren't there anymore, but Jimmy Leach was, was the director of planning at that point in time. And what I asked Jimmy to do with Louisville's rules was, okay, I said, so let's talk about what the intent of your rules are, okay? So if, for instance, Louisville's rules require streets to intersect at 90 degree angles, okay? It's not really that pretty when it does that. And so I said, what the point of that is, is to make it so that people that stop at a street can see cars coming, okay? so. If I put a view easement across the front of these lots where the streets are not intersecting at 90 degrees, I'll make it where you cars can still see each other and yet I don't have to use that 90 degree angle. And, and Jimmy agreed with that. So we were, we were able with that level of detail to go through the, the planning process. We created, frankly, our own zoning categories, uh, which are available to anybody in Louisville. Okay, but at the point in time that we were, were, were negotiating with Louisville, these zoning categories weren't there. And so basically, you know, when we were having the discussions, uh, they said, well, we have this zoning category. And I said, well, if I agree to a minimum house size of X square feet, can I write a new zoning category? <laughs> and, and that's what we ended up doing. And most of Castle Hills fits within one of those new zoning categories. And a lot of times our homeowners association is more restrictive than the actual zoning ordinance itself, which is what allowed us to create the variation in the street ordinance and the street setbacks and the sidewalks and stuff like that. So that really, those were the things that were driving us in the early days at Castle Hills. How did you extend the connected front yard idea to include mail service? And I, I, I talked with the Postal Service at the point in time we were beginning Castle Hills, and they said they would not do a door-to-door -door delivery. Uh, as a matter of fact, they said we won't even, I don't like the mailbox monuments is what I call them. Uh, and they said they wouldn't even do those, and I said, well, I don't want them anyway. Uh, and they said they were going to do gang boxes, which didn't seem like what I wanted to do, so we ended up creating this concept of what we do as a 
mail center in the, in the middle of the community in different places. And the Postal Service delivers to those areas. And then the Homeowners Association opens up the mailboxes with permission from the residents and hand delivers it to the front door of the residents, which to me made it feel more like the neighborhoods we grew up in rather than what you're seeing in the new areas. How have you been able to stay true to the Castle Hills vision over the years? Well, I mean, I think the reason that you can stay true to it to a large extent is because you're not really focused on the specifics as it is what, on what you're trying to create. And when we began development planning out here, as I say, Amazon was a startup, not the second, third largest retailer in the nation. Smartphones didn't exist. I mean, uh, in the earlier years of Castle Hills, uh, probably 90% of our marketing was print. Today, it's about 10%. And so what we've tried to do is evolve with the world as it pertains to it, but while re by remaining true to what we were trying to do, which was create neighborhoods. And to some extent, the role of the developer, as I said earlier, is to make sure he didn't create impediments. And uh, we had things that we wanted to do from a planning standpoint. For instance, we didn't want to do any internal walling within Castle Hills. Okay, so the only areas of Castle Hills that are walled off are the gated areas, the private streets. The rest of our product separations are all done with streets. Uh, and so, and again, my view was that there really wasn't anything significantly different between a person living in a $200,000 house and a $700,000 house. They probably had similar educational backgrounds, similar mores. It was just simply a question of one of them made more money than the other. And I didn't want to separate our residents by income strata. And so uh, the concept of Castle Hills, of which you don't see many internal walls in Castle Hills, was to separate the product with streets rather than with, um, with walls. Which, and we don't really even, we market names for areas when we're doing them, but they're pretty simple in neighbor nature. Uh, our marketing department doesn't always like that, but we tend to call them by geographics, like Castle Hills North. Castle Hill South, Castle Hill Southwest, Castle Hill Southeast. And we don't put those names in the neighborhood. Okay, so once we've stopped selling, they're really not the name of the neighborhood anymore because what I wanted people to perceive is that they lived in Castle Hills, not that they lived in some particular section of Castle Hills. Why did you partner with Louisville? Almost all, well, I'd say all communities have to start with, to put it, somewhat bluntly is how are you going to flush the toilet, okay? And we basically only really had uh, three options. One, to stay in Hebron and build our own sanitary sewer system, uh, to go to Carrollton or to go to Louisville. Uh, it was going to, if we tried to go to the colony or Plano or something like that, we were going to have to lift the sewer, which was going to be very expensive. And so we basically, uh, once we elected to go the route of seeking annexation by either Carrollton or Louisville, I met with both of them. Uh, and I said, here's what I wanted to accomplish. And uh, I ended up having a very strong working relationship with Chuck Owens, who was the city manager at that point in time. Basically, we figured out a way to... to put the deal together and you know, I told Chuck I really didn't want to negotiate with the 30 member staff. I only wanted three or four people in the room at the same time. And so the uh, city of Louisville agreed to that and, and we made great progress doing that. Carrollton, uh, in contrast, basically said uh, they, they didn't have time to meet for about 60, 75 days. Uh, and then when I showed up for the first meeting in Carrollton, there were 30 people in the room. Um, and I said, this isn't what I agreed to do. Uh, and uh, so we, we, by that time, we'd made huge progress with the city of Louisville. And I think by, I mean, this, I had this initial meeting with them all in November of uh, 95. Uh, and by March, we had a deal with Louisville that I thought made sense. And, uh, and so we basically 
ceased negotiations with Carrollton. Uh, the agreement with Louisville was passed in the council meeting on April 1st, 1996. And uh, then Carrollton got involved, uh, and uh, Carrollton came in and, and offered the same deal that Louisville had offered. And, uh, pretty much in writing, signed by every member of their council. And I met with them and, and my dad, uh, with the mayor of, of Carrollton, I said, you know, you've got, you got to understand, we this was prior to April 1st, but we've made a deal. We shook hands, we, we have an agreement. We're, we're not gonna change. So, uh, you know, to us, what we've said we're gonna do is important. And so uh, we stuck with the deal with Louisville. We moved forward with Louisville, and I think it's been a good working relationship. You sign these agreements, and we signed this agreement in April of 96. And the working relationship means that we very seldom actually pull that agreement back out. And it's been adapted and adjusted, and we don't do things ex exactly in accordance with that agreement because we have a working relationship. And, and one of those things that from our standpoint is important to that is, and trust me, I don't always agree with Louisville staff, <laughs> okay? But we don't ever try to go around staff to council, okay? We, we're, we're gonna battle it out with staff to find something that they and we can both agree with. And, then we're gonna to go to council with staff's recommendations. And that's been our approach with Louisville since the beginning. Uh, and I think that's the reason why we have a strong working relationship. We're now on, there is only one council member uh, that was on the council. Uh, and when we signed this agreement, that was Rudy. Okay, Rudy was on the council at that point, the current mayor, Rudy Durham. The entire council has turned over. I'm on my third city manager, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, but all of the city managers have been promoted from within Louisville. So even though we might, I might not have worked with them initially, they were familiar with the history of the agreement, okay. Uh, so, you know, Chuck retired very shortly after we signed the agreement, uh, and I say, you know, I can't remember today whether it was a year or two, but not much longer than that. So I worked with Claude King for, I don't know, 15 years. Uh, and, uh, and Donna was one of his assistant city managers. So when Donna transitioned into it, she transitioned into it with an understanding of the history of the relationship and the history of what we were accomplished. We do think it's important uh, and have always tried to stay true to what we told Louisville we would do at the beginning. And I think if you ask the staff, if, the people who were there at that point in time, we've delivered pretty much everything that we said we were going to do. I mean, when Castle Hills began, the land in Castle Hills was on the tax rolls for about $25, $30 million, okay? Current tax roll in Castle Hills is about $2.8 billion. That's not million, billions. I mean, so we've, we've built 4,500 homes, we've built shopping centers, we've built some office, and, uh, and we're transitioning into the, basically the portion of Castle Hills that is the commercial aspect of it. Uh, and I, I described it as the, the, the residential part of Castle Hills is the area where the residents of Castle Hills live. Our commercial's kind of like the front parlor and the living room, okay? It's how we invite visitors into the community without making them necessarily uh, integral to what we're doing in the community. And so the commercial sites are our daytime population, people that visit the community, and, and but the, the crown jewel of, of Castle Hills is, is and always has been the single family. Sanitary sewer was what drove the choice of negotiating partners in this deal. So uh, we had, had purchased our own water by then. Uh, we had actually made a deal with the Upper Trinity Regional Water District in 1994. So we had water that we could deliver independent of the, uh, of the sanitary sewer 
but you still needed the sanitary sewer. And, and I really didn't want to build a plant within Castle Hills. I mean, so the options really were to stay doing, to figure out a way to work with the city. And I tried to cut a deal with Chuck that said, you know, I would agree uh, if he'd provide me sanitary sewer, uh, that I would agree not to seek annexation by any other city. And he said, that's just giving you exactly what you want, Chris. It's like, <laughs> he said, that's like the rare rabbit telling him not to throw him into the briar patch. I mean, you're trying to get me to give you exactly what you want, which is give you sewer and you can stay outside of the city of Louisville. We're not even going to begin with the discussions with on that basis. And so, and he was right. <laughs> it, was an, it was an accurate appraisal of what I wanted. Uh, so we ended up making that decision to move forward, understanding that we would be in Louisville, that that was the, the ultimate plan. Um, but it might take 20 or 30 years. What are the most significant advantages Castle Hills has to offer? Well, I think it's the lifestyle. I mean, you know, certainly there are, you know, we, we had the benefit of my dad having bought this property a long time ago. So when we began development, there was already a lot of development north of us. I mean, this is, was almost an infill site. I mean, it's kind of hard to call 2,500 acres an infill site, but to some extent it was. The colony had 30,000 people north of us, I think. Frisco was already at a population of about 30,000, 35,000. Uh, and we're significantly south of either one of them. I mean, uh, one of the early things we used to put on the billboards in Castle Hills was that if you lived in Castle Hills, you'd be home now. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it, we had that advantage. We had the advantage that a lot of master planned startup communities don't have, which is with the guy, uh, Ted, uh, from one of the uh, marketing, or one of the uh, survey companies that we use, said that Castle Hills could always pass the Bluebell test. Um, uh, I asked him, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, a lot of these new communities, by the time you get home, home from the grocery store, your Bluebell's melted. He said in Castle Hills, the grocery stores are already there. They're at the perimeter of the property. So the services to our residents were available in the areas of Carrollton immediately to the south of us. Uh, and so when you, when you came into this community, you got the benefits of the new construction. You got the benefits of the new planning aspects. But you still had immediate access to the uh, things you needed to live. What is left to complete the Castle Hills vision? Pretty much all of the commercial, though, as I say, the front door of the community. Uh, you know, we have probably still have 350 acres left to develop. I mean, uh, but we're at the bat last of the single family. I mean, the, the, we've got about 600 lots left, uh, which will put us to about 5,000 single family homes. We'll end up with a, a a population of somewhere probably 25 to 30,000 people at the end of the day. Uh, we will end up with, in our opinion, about uh, $4 billion worth of ad valorem tax base in today's dollars. Uh, and we'll do that in about 2,500 acres, uh, maybe 3,000 acres. And to put that in contrast, I mean, Louisville is about 22,000 acres, okay, outside of Castle Hills. And they're about 10 or $11 billion in tax base. So the benefit to Louisville and what we're trying to do with the commercial, which is the next, next aspect of what we're doing, is we're gonna provide that same or similar amount of tax base, basically at about twice the density level of what Louisville is. And that's what makes us attractive to the city, and that's where the focus is now. And the focus is today creating, we have, like I say, 25 to 30,000 people that will be in our nighttime population. We're trying to create 18 to 22,000 people that will be in the daytime population, uh, which makes our retailers more successful, allows us to provide a higher level of services to, the, uh, to our uh, residents, uh, because those services will be close. But those services to survive need density, okay? They, they need people.
and, uh, and the more utilization I can provide a retailer of the number of hours his store is open, the more successful that retailer is and the better quality retailers I get. What more can you tell us about Crown Center? Well, we're still working through with Louisville on some of those aspects. I, again, that's one of the things that we think that I said has evolved. I mean, we, when, when I looked at the early planning at Castle Hills, I mean, uh, one of the things I looked at was what's wrong with development in the United States? And if you look outside of this country, uh, most of the places outside of the United States have not separated their uses. The office, the retail, the commercial, all meld in with each other. It's only in the United States that we have separated those uses historically. And frankly, I think it's a failed model. Uh, I don't think that model works anymore. So the idea from the beginning at Castle Hill was to find a way to sensitively mix those uses together in a way that they complemented each other rather than created problems for each other. And uh, that's what the approach that we've tried to take from the beginning is at Castle Hills. It is an evolving thing with the city. And, and what's difficult for a developer to do is to understand that the city is routinely thinking 40 to 50 yard, years in front. When I talk about Castle Hills, I'm not talking about just today. I'm talking about what is Castle Hills going to look like 40 years from now, okay? What happens when they're driverless cars? What looks different? How do things change? Well, cities are used to operating on those kind of planning horizons. I don't think many developers are, but because our plan for Castle Hills is to remain involved in Casa Castle Hills through the ownership of a lot of the commercial properties in the long term. We approach it differently than a lot of developers do. You know, I, I, I generate probably out of single family home sales, lot sales, rents and stuff like that, 80 to 90 million dollars a year in revenues out of Castle Hills. The home building revenue will go away and it'll be supplanted over a period of time with rental revenues. Uh, but we're not going away. I mean, I live in the community. My brother lives in the community. Uh, two of his four kids live in the community. Uh, they're raising their children in the community. Well, we are a part of the community. And we are focused not only on the present of Castle Hills, but the future. And, and the relationship with Louisville is to us a big part of that overall view and approach of today and the future of Castle Hills. So I, I think that when, when people are talking about what we're trying to do at Castle Hills, what we're trying to do is create a place where you want to live, okay? And that means that not everybody's the same, so I have to create a bunch of different aspects of that. Some portions of our amenities will be used by some people, some will be used by others. Some people just like to stay in their house, okay? All of those things are just fine, okay? But it's, it is important for us to recognize that this community would not be what it is without its residents, okay? It's, it's not the developer. It's the people who live here that drive and make what Castle Hills what it is today.